Thanks for tuning into our seller interview series. Up today, we've got an e-commerce dropshipping site in the apparels and accessories niche. The site makes right around four thousand dollars per month in net profit. The listing number for this one is four zero three four seven. Now we do these interviews to give potential buyers more information about both the seller and the sites they're looking to purchase. We hope these insights are helpful for you in making a buying decision. We've got the seller Brian with us today to go through the business and cover everything from niche selection to traffic and monetization. Thanks for coming on, Brian. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Justin. All right, buddy. So let's get into it. Just to give a quick summary on the business, it was built in August 2011. The monthly revenue on the site is $5,431, and that's over a 12-month average. We've got expenses coming in at $1,408 a month. That's cost of goods and other things. Net profit is $4,023 a month. And again, that's a 12-month average. We've listed this as a 26X multiple. You've got a few thousand people on the prospective customer list, and you're offering 60 days of email support and eight 45-minute phone calls to help get someone started. Before we even get into this, can you tell me exactly like what's the prospective customer list? You said thousands. Like How many exactly do you have on the list? So the email list that we have set up is just shy of 2,800 people who've opted in to learn more about brand or to potentially win in a contest that we've offered or to get more information about the products. Cool. All right, Brian, give me a like brief update on kind of like your background in building and running websites and online businesses. Like, how'd you get into this whole thing? Yeah, so I've been an entrepreneur since I was about like 14 or so. So, you know, when kids in middle school were, were selling chocolate, I, I started selling fruit flavored candy to fill a gap in the market. And it's always been in me. And as for websites, I've been involved in this particular project for four years now. My specific area of focus has been on marketing and PR. And those two components are really what helped me bootstrap the business from just an idea to now a profitable e-commerce business. How did you come up with the idea for this? It is in the dental fashion niche, and it's kind of unique, kind of interesting. What was the impetus of this? Right, right. So, yeah, it is really unique. And prior to starting a business, I worked with several startups and small businesses in the same industry that I'm in now as an intern. And... The idea for this came from my, I guess, my boots on the ground experience from those past gigs that I had where I saw potential unmet needs in the marketplace. And when people think of this niche, they imagine the product is really expensive or it's typically only worn by celebrities, musicians. And this, again, was just naturally flocking to meet an unmet need. And we branded ourselves as the affordable alternative, and it's really worked wonders for us. So it's a premium product that you basically made available to the masses. It's on a dropship basis. You don't hold any inventory. Is that correct? We do handle the order processing in-house, but it's a very it's structured in a way where it could easily be outsourced or very easily be dropship. Gotcha. Okay. And then you got into the niche because you were already working kind of in the niche a little bit before that. You'd had some experience and said, look, I see an opportunity here. I see a market and I want to take a stab at it. What were you doing before? So prior to getting involved in this, uh, I was just kind of bouncing around between different potential business ideas that I was going with. As I said before, I've always wanted to kind of bootstrap and build something and be an entrepreneur, but I never really had anything definitive or anything that I really felt was concrete enough to run with it. So really prior to getting started with this, it was just kind of like a learning stage and an interning stage and a figuring things out kind of stage for me until I felt I was ready to really dive in with something. Well, let's get into this. So you're selling the business instead of just keeping it or growing it yourself. What's your reason for selling right now? So the biggest reason is I've reached my ceiling with it. The skill set that I mentioned before that I have, it really allowed me to grow it from just an idea to a valuable business. But now I feel it's time for someone else to take over it and really help take it to the next level with a skill set different than mine. So you just don't see much more room for growth for you with what you're able to do. You think it's pretty capped. You want someone else to come in that sees it with fresh eyes and goes, oh, not even close to being capped. I can grow this out further. Right, exactly. That's what it is. I've really reached this ceiling with it for myself, but I'm certain that someone else with a fresh set of eyes and a fresh perspective can absolutely take it to the next level. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So what's your plan for the cash when you sell, Brian? Like, you know, one of the things that buyers want to know is, you know, are you going to turn around and create a site that competes directly with me or are you taking a trip to Hawaii? What's the deal with the cash? 
Yeah, so absolutely, I wouldn't be competing at all. Thankfully, a lot of the stuff I've learned, just building it up to the point that it's at now, affords me the opportunity to pursue a whole bunch of different A vacation would be really nice, but my plan is to just reinvest into a new business. I haven't really figured out exactly what that is, but I would absolutely not be building a competing business. All right, cool. So let's talk a little bit about the site history. I already mentioned that it was built in August 2011. What did the trajectory look like when you started it off? Like, was it an immediate success, like in the first couple of months, or was it kind of a slow burn? So, yeah, it was definitely a slow burn. Unfortunately for me, it wasn't an immediate win. The site started in 2011, like you said, and it was really just a broad fashion accessories brand. But you know what they say, everyone's your customer, nobody's your customer. So from 2011 to about 2013, it was a process of figuring things out, what the highest margin products were that had the fastest turnaround time, all while making sure those products were unique enough to set us apart from competitors without niching us down too much and not having a market at all. So really from the start date in 2011 up until about 2012-2013, it was nailing down exactly what was necessary to make it a profitable winning business. And that's kind of where we're at now. That's cool. So you saw it as a fashion accessory brand. You're doing all kinds of fashion accessories, realized kind of the high margin stuff, realized kind of what your customers were looking for. And then did you dump a lot of the other products and kind of stick to the ones that were working or did you leave those up? Yeah, that's exactly what it was. I did dump products. So in the very beginning, it started off as a t-shirt brand. But after a while, I started to realize there's way too much margin for error with t-shirts. You're dealing with different sexes. You're dealing with different styles. You're dealing with different types, different materials, different turnaround times. I mean, there's really, I looked at it like there's so many ways this could go wrong here. And I was trying to minimize the potential downsides as much as I could. So it started off as a t-shirt brand and then it kind of niched down into fashion accessories because that eliminated the, the gender issue. But then there were still all different kinds of fashion accessories now we're talking. And for the most part, uh, many fashion accessories are typically viewed in this kind of inexpensive way. So we turn it around to a fashion jewelry and the jewelry allowed us to create high margin products. And then it was just figuring out what type of jewelry was best for our specific customer and just based on the experience I had. So it really was just a process of figuring out exactly what was what. And then that's when larger media outlets, Forbes, Business Insider, all these big names began to really take notice. And And that happened once we found our focus. Tell me what you learned from building the site that just worked, that was a winner. Is there anything that you'll apply to future businesses that you learned from building this? So one of the biggest things that was a help for me was knowing exactly who my customer was, number one, because that allowed me to be able to focus much better and address the needs of that particular customer. So that alone is really priceless because in the beginning I was kind of like a chicken with its head cut off, just running around, not really sure who I was talking to, what I was selling. And that's why things kept plateauing versus later on as things progressed, I knew exactly what the need was, exactly who my customer was and everything in between. So you're targeting too wide of an audience, you know, 45, mother of four, soccer mom, sure, I'll target her. Uh, you know, 19 year old girl listens to hip hop, sure, I'll target her. But like exactly. the demographic was just too wide. That was huge. And the, the second biggest thing was to make sure I had customers first. Uh, initially, it was just kind of a passion project in the beginning where I saw all these needs and I was going to start this business and get all the customers in the world as soon as I flicked on the uh, open sign and it really didn't work that way. So customer acquisition and making sure that paying customers were ready to go, so to speak, was another huge thing for me. I think the saying goes test, then invest. So that was a big thing for me that I'm taking away from this whole process is to make sure that I have my eyes fully open when I'm getting into something so I know that it has a potential to produce a return. Okay, thinking about that customer avatar, making sure you got that person locked down and then really going after them. Absolutely. Was there anything you tried with this business that just didn't work, that you thought, you know, oh, I'll try this, this conversion rate thing, or I'm going to try this advertising thing, and it just, like, bombed? So the biggest thing that didn't work for us was paid advertising. I still am really not sure why it didn't work but it just flopped. And that's actually 
it's reflected on the balance sheet for the previous year, you can see there was a ton of investment into paid advertising and the return was really underwhelming. The organic traffic that we built and the reputation and the branding was definitely the biggest plus. That was kind of the yin to the yang there. The advertising didn't work. The organic stuff did work much better. Gotcha. Okay. So organic was working. How did social do? Was that a win? Have you done any social media marketing? I imagine it would be based on the products. So it is an inherently social product, but as far as actual social media marketing, it's really not something that we pursued. Based on the traffic that we have, about 65% of it was organic. 30% of it was direct and referral and really just a very small percentage point of it came from social. And really, I would tie that social into the organic numbers because that was people who were just talking about the product and sharing the product on their own without any kind of push for us, which I think is something that the new buyer could really take advantage of. Social is definitely a tremendous opportunity for the business. Yeah, I think talking to you, you're willing to do quite a few calls. I think new buyer, you know, really understanding the customer base, really understanding the customer. I'd want to have a few calls probably on that and better understand like who it is that, you know, who's buying these products and who your customer is. And then also I would test through some social media because I think there's some value there with these products. Tell me a little bit more about the traffic. So you said you're getting some referral, some direct traffic. Have you gotten any mentions, any, you know, online mentions through, you know, like tier one or tier two sites or anything? Do you get any traffic from that? So that was actually the biggest chunk of traffic that we were getting in the beginning. And it, it still is a, much of it trickles back to us now. We've had coverage everywhere from Forbes, Inc. and Business Insider, Huffington Post, and these very mainstream ones to outlets that are much more targeted and much more viewed by our customers. And that's really been the biggest thing for us as far as traffic is the organic and the direct and the referral through the publicity that we've generated as a result of type of product it is because the product is inherently newsworthy. That's the biggest thing, which is why we've had to do virtually zero advertising the entire time. It's just an, an eye catching product. That's really interesting and really it fits kind of your PR background. That's probably something we could talk about in a separate podcast episode or something. It's interesting because we paid a few people to do some PR for us. And it's fascinating to see kind of how they work today and how they basically get content up on the big site. So it's cool to know that you got that as right. a skill. Let's talk a little bit about the earnings and history. I mean, how many SKUs do you have? Like how many SKUs do you have on the product? So from the time that the business started up until... Now, it's really gone up and down a lot. And again, that had to do with just building the site and figuring out what the winning products and what weren't the winning products. Right about now, I want to say we have 12 key items that we sell. About three of those consist of just different variations, different colorways, and different editions of products. Limited edition versions, special editions, again, different colorways, and those have been the core products that have helped get the business to where it is now. The really good thing about it, too, and another great opportunity is that despite having these 12 key products here, there's a tremendous potential for spinoff products and for complementary products to go with these main ones. Gotcha. And then you said you hold some inventory. How much inventory do you have right now? Like what's the dollar amount, the wholesale dollar amount that you have? I want to say about, well, with the holidays coming up, we're looking at about maybe $2,500 okay. okay. inventory now. But it's the biggest thing that we like to do is to hold as little as we can at once, just to, again, minimize any potential risk because of the manufacturer that we work with. And the relationship we've had with them for years now, the turnaround time is really high and we're a priority customer with them. So that allows us to kind of get orders into the queue, get the product to us and get it out all within a week or less. I mean, it's very fast. I'm looking at this, you know, you make about $5,400 a month over the last 12 months with expenses of only $1,400 and that includes your cost of goods. It's a pretty high margin product. Like how much do you buy one for on average and how much do you sell it for? So the products are purchased for $3 a piece, anywhere from 3 to $6 a piece. 
and they're sold from anywhere from fifty, sixty dollars on the higher end to about forty to fifty dollars on the lower end. Wow, that's ridiculously nice margins. I'm really, yeah, what a disappointment that you couldn't get the paid traffic stuff to work. I mean, do you have any background in paid traffic, or did you pay someone to do that, or did you just try and figure it out? Absolutely none. There was a brief time, and again, this too is reflected on the balance sheet. There was a brief time last year where we also tried to work with an outside group for some help with generating paid traffic, and it really was just a cash flow bleed for us. And the reason why there's virtually zero paid traffic, except during those few months when we tried it for the first time, it kind of was a necessity for me starting out because I, I bootstrapped the business. I didn't have any outside funding whatsoever. So I really didn't have an option to invest into customer acquisition through paid routes. I really had no choice in the beginning except to take advantage of the PR potential afforded by the type of product that it is. That was really all I had starting out and it worked. So that, you know, my logic was why fix it if it's not broken? But now I'm starting to see that the advertising isn't broken. It's just not something I know how to use. Yeah. So if the right person comes in who has a background in that can execute properly, I mean, I can't even wrap my mind around the potential for that to work. Yeah, I bet you're pretty bummed you could get to work because the margins are there. I mean, it's a smaller, like, it's not a terribly expensive item, so that may have been one of the issues for you. Let's talk about the stability of earnings. Now, I see in November 2014, you did quite well and then crushed it in December 2014. Is that a Christmas thing? Yes, it's not seasonally based, but a big chunk of the revenue comes in during the holiday time. It really is, it's an interesting kind of gift to get. Things really start to pick up around October, November, December. But then again, because of the type of product it is, it can really pick up at any time. Of course, during Black Friday and during other holiday times, it definitely soars. But leveraged correctly, it can pick up any time. Gotcha. Okay. And aside from November, December, it seems to be relatively steady. It seems like your worst month this year so far has been September, but it picked up again in October, relatively stable though over the last 12 months. Right. Talk to me a little bit about content on the site. I mean, are you regularly adding content? Are you blogging? Are you, or is it just, you know, the content that's up there, maybe one post a month? Like, how does that work? So really what we've been doing lately is just a few posts here and there. To be frank, there really hasn't been much structure or strategy with the content. It's just been another testing ground for us to see what works and what doesn't. And what we've gleaned from this, and this is one of the three key opportunities that I found at search engine optimization and content strategy has the potential to be tremendous coupled with a paid advertising, social and adding new products. But as far as the content goes, we've put up a few pieces just to kind of gauge what the impact would be. And it's been positive. It's worked out well. And the one downside is that you can only write about this product so much yourself without it coming across as overly self-promotional. Yeah, yeah. But because of the niche that it's in, there's tons of potential spinoff content, whether you're talking about artists in a particular genre that wear the types of accessories, songs that mention this type of accessory that you can post the lyrics to. Those are just a few of the different things that we've tried. And just putting the content up there with some basic SEO has produce spikes in traffic for us, which is great. So the content strategy, it can work if it's ran with and applied consistently. Okay, so let's do some quick questions here. How many suppliers do you currently have? There's two. We have the primary supplier and then a secondary just in case. Okay, two suppliers. There's not a whole lot of content. Are you shopping for new products pretty regularly? How often do you add new products? I have not been shopping for new products. We've really just been focusing on the core ones, but our manufacturers have the capability to produce the new products without any hiccups. And we've introduced a few with uh, some good results too. What would you say are the biggest opportunities if someone were looking to buy the site or if you were going to keep the site and not sell it off, what would you do to grow the site today? The three key things that I would focus on, SEO and content strategy. I think there's a potential there for it to be tremendous. Adding new products would also be tremendous. I think that's a very intelligent way to kind of build out the business because all you're doing is adding new things. You're not paying for any outside 
traffic or anything like that. You're simply just adding more products to the mix that the customer is already interested in. And, and I think social is also a tremendous opportunity because, again, it's an inherently newsworthy product. And the, the type of product it is, it generates discussion. It generates talk. So if leveraged correctly, social could be a huge opportunity. Are you dropshipping any of the products or is it all shipped from you yourself? Are you sourcing it? Like, How does that work? We handle all the pick, pack, and fulfillment here. Okay, cool. So what I see, let's talk a little bit about the risk. So we went over the opportunities. And by the way, I would say social, I think, could be really big. I'd say Facebook paid ads. I would definitely try that. I do some Instagram stuff. I think there's some opportunity there for this particular product. SEO, as you mentioned, of course. I think there's some interesting stuff going on there. What do you see as the biggest risk? If you're keeping this site, what would keep you up at night? What are the things that you're like, oh, I'm not sure this is fantastic? What worries you? It's the biggest pro and the biggest con bundled into one. It's not your average fashion accessory at all whatsoever. And because of that, the room for growth, and this is speculation here again, the room for growth is very linear. It's not something that you could go and have in every major retail store in the country or in the world. It's a very specific customer in very specific areas who listen to specific kinds of music. It's very niche, and that's the pro and the con. I'd yeah, say. it makes it easier to target your market, but at the same time, you look at it and you're like, well, there's only so many people buying this product. This isn't Beanie Babies or Cabbage Patch Kids. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you're not, uh, exactly. Yeah, you're not going crazy with this. Okay, so that's limiting. I think to help counter that is you have to look at your market a little closer and see like what other types of products they're buying. I'm sure that you've looked at that, but I mean, I think there are probably other opportunities in the fashion niche, and you need to test through different products to figure out what that is. Any other risks? I mean, most of your traffic is organically based. Are you using a PBN on the site or any like, you know, backlinks? Have you paid for backlinks or anything like that? No, no. Again, cost turned me away to all of those methods. So again, I had no choice but to do everything through elbow grease. It was just emailing people, sharing it with people all organically. And yeah, there's been no paid backlinks at all whatsoever. Nothing of that sort used at, at all whatsoever. So the other risk I'd have to say is, let's say for someone that owns, I don't know, you know, five or six e-commerce sites right now, and he's got like a team and it's all set up or whatever. I'm not sure that adding the site is a big win. I mean, like, you know, because of the amount of work required and the amount of money made, there's not a ton, I think, of value there. I think it's amazing for someone that's looking to get into e-commerce, that's looking to test out like an e-commerce site and see how it works and kind of get their feet wet, get behind it a little bit, and I like, actually test through it. I think it's a great site for that. And it's because it's a small market and a small niche and you're offering so much support, it'd be relatively easy for someone to get into e-commerce. So I think it's a pretty good fit for someone like that. All right, that's a huge thing there. I really want to offer a lot of support for the new buyer. This isn't something that I'm just trying to ditch and run away from. This is your problem now because I put so much time into this and because there's a tremendous amount of brand value attached, number one, and two, there's a very large retail relationship that is attached, but it's just not utilized at the moment. It's really important for me to see this work for the new buyer as well. Brian, tell me a little bit about the type of work you do on the site. What do you do on a daily or weekly or monthly basis? So the process has really been refined over the years. It's now down to less than a few hours a week. And the time is divided up between customer service, pick, pack, and order fulfillment. And that's about an hour a day there. And then I factor in another hour a week or two just to oversee everything else, whether that's combing through sales reports, checking in on potential chargebacks or potential returns. But again, really the work and skills required are really down to a minimum. And the most time will be spent on the customer service and the pick pack and fulfillment, really. And those two components can easily be outsourced. Gotcha, Brian. One of the concerns I have about buying this, you know, obviously I want to make sure that you're not going to turn around and compete with me right away. Would you be willing to commit to a non-compete with a buyer for two years, three years, something like that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. We already talked about the support you're willing to offer. I mean, obviously you're offering the email support and I said the eight phone calls, which I think are really help a new e-commerce buyer kind of get off the ground and get this up and running. Are you open to, now obviously if you can get full cash up front, that would be ideal. That's what you're looking for here. And a buyer that brings that is going to be more likely to get the deal. But let's say you had a buyer that came to you and said, look, you know, I'll pay 70% up front, 
but I'm a new e-commerce buyer and I want to pay 30% after 30 days of training. Is that something you'd be open to? I think that's reasonable. I definitely think that's reasonable. And again, these potential financing offers, I'd definitely be open to hearing. But the biggest thing for me is I'm looking to create some value and liquidity for what I've built up here. And I think that's a reasonable request considering what this all is going to be coming with. And again, that's why I also plan to offer such comprehensive support is to make sure that it's a win for whomever gets involved with it and that there's not a thing they don't understand about the business. Awesome, Brian. That sounds fair to me, man. Let's do a quick wrap up on this business. As I mentioned at the top, it's an e-commerce business in the apparel and accessories niche, specifically dental fashion. It was built in August 2011. It's got a ton of mentions from the PR that you've done on the site. The monthly revenue on this is 5400 bucks a month. That's a 12-month average. Expenses at 1400 Net profit of just about $4,000, again, over a 12-month average. We're using a 26X multiple based on the multi-net monthly profit. And you've got a few thousand prospective customers on the email list that people can target. There's some opportunity for Facebook, and you're offering 60 days email support and eight 45-minute phone calls to get someone started. Uh, Brian, if you could give me your best pitch in the next 30 seconds on why someone should purchase this site, what would it be? It's a unique, high-margin fashion accessories brand with a branding history that I'd say would be almost impossible to replicate. Awesome, Brian. Thanks so much for coming on, by the way. For anyone listening to this, if you're watching this on YouTube or wherever else, if you look down in the show notes, you'll be able to click a link that will take you over to the listing page and give you more information about this business for sale. If you're on the listing page at empireflippers.com and you want to know all the details behind this site, including the URL, all the earnings history, the traffic, everything, go ahead and click on the deposit button, make a refundable deposit, and we'll share all that information with you to help you make a buying decision. Again, Brian, thanks. Thanks so much for coming on, man. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me.